hi everybody and welcome. Welcome to the webinar today, um, exploring the research for coaching and education. My name is Sharon Taylor and I'm the Managing Consultant for Growth Coaching International, joining you from Brisbane, Queensland, Australia, and delighted to host this afternoon a session um, with Margaret Barr and uh, really looking forward to, to hearing the presentation and also thank you, Margaret, for being here um, with us as our guest presenter. It's going to be fabulous. So we're really excited that we have um, um, that we have so many people joining us and from all over the world. We had people register from many, many countries. So I thought I might share a couple of those with, or a few, all of those with you. So lots. So New Zealand, um, UK, the US, South Africa, Brazil, Sweden, Qatar, Canada, Belgium, the Isle of Man, France, Ireland, Singapore, and of course. Um, quite a, a lot of Australians in there as well. So <laughs> pretty amazing to have um, be able to connect with you all today and thank you so much for joining, joining us. So briefly, um, the intent for today's webinar uh, is that Margaret will firstly provide um, you with an overview of the research and resources for coaching and education and then we'll have some time to unpack questions and comments that you might have. So um, I invite you to add your questions into the um, Q&A box, that would be great. And then, um, yeah, and we'll be able to respond to some of those after the presentation. We anticipate that we'll be finished within um, about an hour, right, Margaret? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's, um, let's go. I'm gonna introduce Margaret um, officially first. So it's my great pleasure to introduce you, Margaret. Um, many of you will know Margaret and um, Margaret is the, our lead associate of uh, Scotland for Growth Coaching International and works with educators as a coach consultant and facilitator of um, coach training programs. She has many years of experience as a head teacher and works with educators as a coach consultant and facilitator of um, coach training. She has many years of experience as a head teacher and has been involved in various research projects related to coaching and educational contexts. So perfect for presenting today. Um, she's a researcher and research supervisor at the University of East London and is a published author in coaching and education and the book review editor for Coaching and International Journey of Theory, Research and Practice. So on a voluntary basis, Margaret also provides admin support for coaching supervision leadership team, for sorry, the coaching leadership, supervision leadership team of the Association for Coaching, and is especially interested in the use of attentive conversations to support the well-being of educators and learners. So, thank you, Margaret, um, for presenting for us today. Perhaps you could start um, with sharing a little bit about yourself and how you came to the world of coaching or the space of coaching and education, and then more specifically um, with the research. Thank you, Sharon. That that was a, a lovely introduction. Thank you so much. And yes, here in Scotland, it's eight in the morning. So um, it, good morning to everybody from this part of the world. And, it, and it's it's lovely to be with you today. Yes, just very briefly, you've said a lot of it already. I had a career in education. I ended as a head teacher of a, a secondary school in Glasgow. And when I retired, I went back to university and took a master's in coaching psychology, really interested in coaching. I actually went to a career coach to find out what my next career um, could be. And it turned out that I had an aptitude for coaching and fascinated in it. Really re regrets too strong a word, but I wish I had done more with it when I was in schools, because I would have been a much better head teacher altogether and better mm -hmm. educated probably a better parent really to be honest too um, and then I at uh, the University of East London I met Christian Van Yerberg and John Campbell and became involved in Growth Coaching International in, in Scotland bringing our programs and so on here I, I love working for GCI the integrity the the credibility uh, and the, the warmth of everyone, it, it's just absolutely wonderful. It's a real privilege. I really enjoy it. And then I get to do exciting things like this with you. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Oh, wow. That's great insight. Thank you very much. All right. So um, so are you ready to um, will we get yeah, started on yeah. the presentation? Yeah, ready to go. So um, I'm just going to share my screen and hope that this happens reasonably smoothly. Thank um, you. So we think this might be maybe 15 minutes or so. Um, 
is just an overview of research and resources in uh, coaching and education that I that I know of, and um, so we know that we've got people from all over the world here today, and I expect that we've got a range of different people with with different. Um, interests and and whether you're a you know a master's student a doctoral student looking for the research literature or you're just curious or maybe you're um, a practitioner and you're you're looking for some ideas you're thinking about um, introducing a, a coaching intervention in your school or doing a wee bit more I hope that you'll find something useful here so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a resource which you you may have received a, a link to this resource um, which has got as much um, research and other resources about coaching and education that I can find. I'll show you what's in that and, and where to find it. Then I'll do just some headlines, really, just some main um, pointers about what the research and education, uh, coaching and education shows us, and just some examples. And I'll do that around the global framework for coaching and mentoring and education. And then at the end, just some things for you to think about what you would like to do next, just an invitation for you to decide what you want to do next. So this is the front page of the resource and that's the, the link. Now, if you use that link, it's just a bitly link, um, you will always get the most recent version of the resource. It's 60 pages at the moment and it's what is in it, I think that content's maybe a bit in the small side, but there's a list of websites um, that have coaching and education resources and information, blogs and social media, podcasts and so on. Um, the, the bulk of it really is journal articles and working papers and other articles about coaching and education. There's a list of books and book chapters and some reports and other publications. So, for example, um, just to, to clarify a wee bit, it covers all sectors of education. So early years, primary, middle school, secondary, further education, higher education, alternative provision, special education, all sectors of education um, and all interests are, are, are covered in there. If I could find an article that said it had to do with coaching and education, it's in there. And by the end of March, um, there were 462 articles. That's a mixture of peer-reviewed journal articles and things that were not. You know, there, there's other things. There's um, doctoral dissertations in there. There's put papers that people have put on academia and ResearchGate and so on. There's all sorts of things in, in the articles section. 78 books, 26 chapters in books, reports, you know, for example, the reports, that really helpful report that Rachel Lofthouse, uh, Lofthouse Lead and Towler, 2010 about a uh, coaching for teaching and learning a practical guide for schools so all these practical guides that, that that people have published from all over the world um are in there that i can find and the websites and blogs podcasts for example richard reed in northern ireland his podcast headroom we mentioned that try i try as much as possible to keep it up to date and you know i, I definitely invite other people to tell me about things that are missing so we can put them in. The research studies are almost all qualitative. There's a meta-analysis, there's a small number of randomized control trials. Mostly it's qualitative research studies, the practical guides. And it, there are a lot of um, working papers. Uh, many of you will be familiar with Collective Ed at Leeds Beckett University, the Carnegie School of Education and the working papers that are published, fantastic resource, um, practice insight papers and think pieces and so on. So anything there that's to do with coaching and education, that's gone into the resource as well. So the resources are all just listed. There are just entries with hyperlinks to the actual paper itself. And it started some years ago when I was doing looking at an early version of that course that, that you um, moderate now, Sharon, the Understanding Coaching and Education, it started off as a, a short list, two or three pages perhaps, of um, research papers and books about coaching and education. I thought, I think we could probably expand on this. And Christian um, was really helpful to me in um, advising me about how to do it and what to put in, for example, making sure that the links go to the publisher's website, you know, and not the Amazon website. Um, so he certainly 
um, was very, very helpful and, and continues to be very helpful in advising and keeping this up to date. Some health warnings, really, it's just papers in English language. Now, I know that there are papers in a Turkish language, for example, that are not in there. There are also, I understand there are um, papers in German. They're not there yet. It's also, it's about coaching. It's not about mentoring. Perhaps someone else would, you know, would do something similar in mentoring or would expand on this. And the other thing is, there are, well, two other things really about this term coaching and education. First of all, we've taken anything where it, they're using, the, the authors are using the term coaching. We, we expect and assume that there are different interpretations of what coaching is in each of those papers. And in fact, sometimes even when the terminology is exactly the same, like instructional coaching, how people have interpreted it is not always the same. So we know, for example, Sharon, as you know, in, in GCI, we're using the growth framework, which is founded in psychological theories and principles and, and research. We don't know that all the, the coaching that's in here has been that. We've just accepted it without judgment and just at face value. If it says coaching in education, it's in, it's in the resource. The other thing is that there are a lot of other things that, that are not specifically coaching and education elsewhere that are relevant. So, for example, there's a lot of generic coaching research and research into leadership coaching in other fields that are really relevant to education, but they're not in here. Um, other uh, psych psychological theories about um, solution focus uh, coaching and well-being coaching um, goal setting, all these things, they're elsewhere. Um, so there's a, an assumption that you have access to these other things. And the main thing really is it is an invitation for anyone to contribute to it. Please let me know if any hyperlinks don't work yet um, or if there's anything that's missed. And I'm sure there will be things that are missed. It's a, it's a labour of love actually just trying to stay on top of it. And sometimes I discover a new resource and I go down a rabbit hole um, with a whole load of uh, new papers I hadn't discovered. Before we go any further, <clears throat> there's a couple of comments here I'd like to share with you. And this first one, um, I think it's really, really powerful. I attended um, a, a conference in 2013, the, the British Psychological Society Special Group in Coaching Psychology, and Professor Sarah Corey was there. And she did a presentation about at the evidence base in coaching. And this statement here, I just thought was so powerful. Evidence-based practice is most helpful when understood as a context for learning and discovery rather than justification. And I think that's so relevant for those of us in education because we are constantly being exposed being expected to justify and to be accountable and sometimes uh, people are looking for to looking for us to say oh that's fine I've got that sorted I can tick that box and I, I believe that's that's not a helpful way to to view the coaching research and here's another uh, comment that that Sarah uh, published recently a book I was just reading just now about emerging coaching emerging conversations in coaching when we conceptualize researches, research is concerned primarily with justification and accountability, we can lose sight of other roles that it can play in helping us to learn and grow in a climate of um, discovery. So the research that we have here, although there might be other people, perhaps our bosses who are wanting us to just be simplistic about it and say, that works, we'll do that, we can tick that box. The theme really is about learning and discovery, I, I believe. So I'm going to give some headlines now about what the research um, has told us about coaching and education and to do it within this framework, the global framework for coaching and mentoring uh, in education devised by three heroes of mine, uh, Christian Van Neuerberg, John Campbell and Jim Knight. Um, it's a really helpful framework. It shows you within that outside circle, that educational environment, it's proposing four contexts where coaching and education could take place, useful context for research, useful context for trying things out in practice. 
and just starting at uh, top right, educational leadership and going anti-clockwise. So coaching for educational leadership, coaching for the student experience, that's for students and young people um, being coached, coaching for professional practice. So teaching and learning classroom practice and other professional practice and coaching for community engagement. And in the middle, the absolutely crucial part that all of this is ultimately for the benefit of student success and well-being. So I'm just starting with educational leadership, I've just got two or three examples of things here. So this can be leaders being coached or leaders learning to coach and then coaching others. And the research has shown that coaching can improve retention for example, by supporting well-being, and it's just so vital to look after everyone's well-being, and, and there's increased awareness of that now. So, some recent examples: um, a, a paper that I was fortunate involved, fortunate enough to be involved with, with Christian and Chris Monroe, and two other colleagues um, last year. Aspiring school principals in Australia who receive coaching as part of a leadership development program experience an increase in psychological safety, positive emotions, and clarity about what was important to them. These are really, really powerful outcomes from coaching. And that was coaching that was provided by GCI coaches. Another recent and really interesting and helpful, uh, valuable paper from Rachel Lofthouse and Ruth White Whiteside, um, based out of Leeds Beckett University in um, the UK. Head teachers in England who had coaching were better able to manage complex demands. Their feelings of isolation reduced and they experienced a positive impact on their self-belief and confidence. Really powerful stuff. There is also research evidence to show that coaching enhances other in interventions so that if coaching happens alongside something else, it enhances um, the implementation of that. So, so for example, school principals in a USA study who received coaching a feedback and coaching about the feedback were more likely to change the professional behaviour than those who were given feedback alone. It's actually a respectful way to engage with someone is to involve them in a, an equal coaching conversation to talk about the feedback, to talk about um, the, the next bit, for example, the staff training event followed by coaching, the implementation rates much higher than if people are just left to go on with it. You think of courses that you might have been. I know I've been in courses. I've thought, oh, that's so interesting. That, that I'd really love to do that. I'm energized. And then you go back into school. And if there, there isn't the support to continue to, you know, to follow it through. And that can be worse than never having had that exciting new knowledge or um, insights in the first place. So when job embedded coaching, um, coaching about the thing that you've learned, the staff training event, when that accompanies it, the implementation rate is much higher. And uh, on a similar slant, the uh, continuing about coaching enhances other interventions. I'm now on to professional practice. So it's not just about leadership coaching that coaching enhances other interventions. Um, in 2005, uh, Curie, the Center for the, the Use of Research and Evidence in Education, now there's a powerful statement. Learning to be a coach or mentor is one of the most effective ways of enabling teachers and leaders to become good and excellent practitioners. And teachers who receive developmental coaching, uh, drawing and theories of leadership experience increased goal attainment, reduced stress and enhanced workplace well-being and resilience. Um, I'm, I'm just aware that I'm reading what's on the slide, but there could be some people out, you know, jogging, listening, and I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that they, they get all of this. So really, really powerful um, effect of coaching on other interventions and other um, staff training events. Still within professional practice, peer coaching, coaching, there are several studies um, several published studies, and I'm sure there are other studies that are not published, showing that coaching can be a helpful means of providing peer support among educators. Um, and peer coaching is most effective when the peer coaches have engaged with coaching training. And that's been proven as well, that if people are given some training about coaching, the principles of coaching um, 
and everyone understands it. There's a shared understanding of that before it starts. And, and both people know what coaching is and what's going to happen. But of contracting really in addition to the, the training that it is going to be most effective. And instructional coaching. And for European audiences, um, instruction, instructional practice is what you might call teaching practice or pedagogy. So it's coaching around um, the practice of teaching the instructional practice in the classroom. And there's a, a variety of papers. There's a lot of papers about instructional coaching and they're mostly from uh, the USA. And there's an extensive range of excellent papers and resources from Dr. Jim Knight, whom I mentioned, the Instructional Coaching Group at the University of Kansas. Uh, and he's generously shared over 20 years, and um, the, the link is there, absolutely fantastic resources that are freely made available, lots of research studies. And we, we think, as far as we know, Jim Knight was the first person to use the term instructional coaching. Really what it was all about when he started was finding a way to partner with people when they were learning how to improve in the classroom. And that partnership approach, which I just think is so powerful in the, uh, the model of, of um, instructional coaching that, that Jim Knight um, uses and writes about and is engaged with. I, I just think that partnership approach is so important. And, and that's where in the term instructional coaching came from, we think. Also in instructional coaching, there, there's a, a meta-analysis a couple of years ago, but three years ago from Craft et al. They, they took a range of studies about co instructional coaching and tried to draw some conclusions. And the, the findings that, they, that came out of it was that pairing coaching with group trainings gave larger effect sizes on both instruction and student achievement, similar to what I said a moment ago. Pairing coaching with instructional resources, that's teaching resources and materials is associated with greater gains. So this is all about teaching practice, instructional practice. And the quality and focus of the coaching may be more important than the actual number of contact hours. That's really interesting. That high quality coaching done well and the, that laser focus on what's important um, can be more important than just like the number of contact hours, just depends on what you're doing during those, those hours. So continuing now uh, around the, the global framework, the student experience, and there is clear um, evidence that coaching can have a, a positive impact on the well-being and academic achievement of uh, students. And that's um, secondary age students and um, university students. And in 2009, Passmore and Brown did a, a three year study of school students being coached, and it showed positive results in well being and academic achievement. That was quite an investment for those schools who had people coaching the students over three years, and it, it made a difference. There, there was positive results in their well being and in their academic achievement. A study from Wendy Madden, um, a Green and Grant in Australia, strengths-based coaching supported the well-being of primary students. And this is so powerful. I mean, I've, I've often said that I believe primary, that there's so much potential in primary schools for children to learn a coaching approach and to be able to coach one another without even calling it coaching. So it's just like a, a way of being <clears throat> like sort of core skills. And also coaching built hardiness and hope in senior high school students. Uh, that these are um, rigorous uh, randomized control trials, these studies. The other thing is that, and, and this is um, really interesting that when, when students are trained to coach other students, there are benefits for the coach, for the older student, usually it's an older student, as well as the coachee. And there are, there are two or three studies showing this. So this study from uh, Christian Van Uerberg and Chloe Tong, student coaches were trained to coach near peers. So I think there were perhaps, it could have been 17 year olds coaching 15 year olds or approximately that. The project showed benefits for the student coaches. Their 
emotional intelligence improved and their communication skills and their study skills improved, as well as for the, the young people that were being coached. So, so much um, benefit there beyond what you might have expected. And now it's coaching and uh, community engagement. So this could be parents trained to coach their children, parents being coached by teachers and others, and members of the community um, coaching people. And th there are certainly, I know of um, locally here, programs where members of the community are mentoring people in schools. There are, there are lots of programs that are not necessarily published. Um, so there's not a lot of published research in this area and there's a huge potential really for using coaching to strengthen relationships with the broader school community. I've just picked out one example from a Grace Graham, a, a fellow master's student with me. She, pub she published her study. Um, parents who were coached to address anxieties about their children's transition to primary school and who then used coaching with their children those parents reported reduced stress about their child going to primary school and increased empowerment and improved confidence about the, the transitions. So really interesting potential there for involving parents in coaching. And of course, the main thing, as we said at the beginning, this is ultimately about the well-being, the success and the well-being of um, the students whatever age they are, whatever context they're in. This is this is why we're doing it. It's absolutely vital that we look after the well-being and success of the staff. And I use the word staff as in like educators, everybody that's involved in education. Um, and we have a, a moral imperative to do that. And we also have a moral imperative to look after the students too. That's ultimately what it's all about. So really thinking about what would be next for you. Um, thinking about you know, what you're interested to do with what you might have learned or found out about today or contacts you might make networking with other people. What is it that interests you? Thinking about actually our responsibilities as, as leaders in education. What, what can we do to try things out and to share with others? Um, and what is it we want to know? How, how could we proceed? What research interests us? And Sharon, I know you're going to speak in a minute. It would be really interesting about um, people in the Understanding Coaching Education course who have done the research module, who have looked at some of these resources and have thought, well, what do I want to research? What inquiry do I want to engage in? What do I want to find out? And whether you're doing it in a formal way through a university um, or whether you're doing it on your own, one thing to think about is that it's done ethically. That's one of the advantages of doing it through a university or with partners with, with university is that the ethical practice um, the, the fact that you have to apply for ethical approval actually means that you're unlikely to forget something that you might be accidentally doing that's, that's unethical. It's, it's really vital to get the ethical angle right. Um, so thinking about whether you're doing something formal, something a bit less formal, thinking about who you can collaborate with. Um, if you're interested in practitioner inquiry, there's a really useful, curious, Convo from about a year ago on the GCI website. Uh, Andrea and, and Chris were speaking to George Gilchrist, uh, who's also had a book published about it. So um, practitioner inquiry, getting involved with other people outside of your own immediate area, I would, I would suggest collaborate with others because, you know, it should be fun and it should be interesting as well as finding things out. Also think about how you would disseminate what you find out. Publishing in a peer-reviewed journal is not for everybody. Publishing in a less formal way, for example, in the working papers um, from Collective Ed is a, a, a great way of um, sharing your thinking as you go along and sharing your, your findings. And there are other ways to do it. You know, collecting stories about people, publishing them, voices. Other things you 
might want to do um, if you want to network with other people at GCI we have a, a LinkedIn group a coaching and education research network there's not a lot of activity on it at the moment people are just connecting but that is a way to find other people who are interested in coaching and education research and every um, now and again, um, Christian and Rachel Lofthouse put on the International Coaching and Mentoring and Education Research Work Network. Last year, it was virtual. People come along who have got some research they want to share and they, they talk about their research and they perhaps ask other people's questions in the discussion. So if you're into research and looking for some support, you might want to look out for the next event. So here's a an invitation for you to think about what you might want to do. What is your area of focus? Is it about well-being as, for example, um, in the uh, a recent chapter by uh, Mark Adams and, and Jack Lee, they, they spoke speaking about coaching and education and suggesting that really to get flourishing organizations, we can be coaching, we can be focusing on the coaching of educators and, um, and students for well-being. Is it something else? Is it very um, instructional teaching practice focused? What is it that you're thinking about? And what one small step will you take within the next 24 hours? And if we were in a workshop, I would be quiet for a minute while you wrote that down, but I'm just going to keep going because um, we're not in a, in, a, in a real workshop together. So just to finish off, you'll you'll get these slides. I'll do a PDF of the slides and we'll make them available on the website and you, you'll get them when you uh, get the recording. That's just some contact details. I would encourage you to subscribe to the latest coaching and education insights. We've got the GCI insights. We've got the monthly coach ed. So I, I would encourage you to sign up for all the information, free resources and so on. And just so that you know, I wasn't making this up, there are also some uh, references at the end. I'll just stop sharing now. Fantastic. Thank you, Margaret. That was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, so much. We've got some, we've got a few comments here in the, um, right. in the Q and A and a couple uh -huh. of questions, but um, yes, fantastic. Thank you so much. That was really quite, um, detailed and in-depth, wasn't it? There's so much, um, yeah. it's amazing the extent of, yeah, what is available. Um, mm -hmm. So, and I noticed you you mentioned Richard Reed, and Richard is on the webinar, so I thought I'd do a little um, okay. shout out. Oh, hello, Richard. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> I heard that name and thought, oh, well, it's Richard's here. <laughs> John, John Campbell, thank you, John. Here's a question here about um, the accessibility. So how accessible are most of the journal papers? So that's just a little... Yes, that's a really good question. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. Each entry has a hyperlink to the official journal website. If it has been made open access, then um, you'll be able to read the whole thing. If it's behind a paywall, that's that's more of a, of a problem. People with university accounts can get access to them. And what and a lot of papers, for example, the papers that we've done um, via University of East London are available in the UEL repository, not the, the final published paper, but the, the, the version just before publication, the accepted manuscript, and we'll put links. I think, as far as I know, I'll need to check, but I think we've got links to them as well. We've put the link to the repository, to the open access um, part. Um, the other thing is you can do some searching of your own, go on ResearchGate or um, Academia, and sometimes you can find the paper, the full paper there. The author has put the whole paper there, or you can ask the author. You can email or contact the paper through um, Academia or ResearchGate and say, would you be willing to send me your paper? So they're not as accessible as we would like, but I'm hoping that by giving the link to the, the journal, that that is a start even for somewhere to look. Mm. Thank, you. thank you and John's commented there that most offer at least an abstract um yes yes uh -huh. that little insight yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. thank you Excellent. Christian suggested at the at the, the beginning and, I, and this is something I've still not done I think it's a great idea is if in addition to um the a link to the paper it would be wonderful I could have 
the abstract and a wee bit more like the key points, especially if something is behind a paywall and you and you can't read it, but I haven't haven't done that yet. And in fact, they're not even categorized under the global framework yet. Just it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. I need to try and get it organized a wee bit better. Okay. So um, hmm. You were you were talking about that some of the people that have engaged with that resource through the understanding coaching and education um, program, Sharon, and and there were some really interesting insights there. Are, are you happy to share them with yeah, folks? Of course, yeah. Thanks, Margaret. So the so understanding coaching and education is our six week um, six week six module conceptual um, and theoretical. Um, so we we've um, we promote it as an introduction to the field of coaching um, in education and that it's conceptual and theoretical online course. So basically six weeks um, and um, a fairly significant uh, review and update of that was undertaken last year. So by our esteemed colleagues, Christian and um, Andrea Heraldes, both from the University of East London. So, so that's been amazing to kind of um, pilot that program and get some great input. And as you said, Margaret, the, the use of, so in module five, um, it focuses on research and the research and coaching and education and gives people the opportunity to unpack that resource document. And, um, and some of the, it was just, it's some of the incredible um, insights and sharings that people have kind of come up with in that section um, yeah, it's been, it's, I, I've just found that really, um, you know, um, interesting. Some of the things that I think just in summary or in terms of what people are taking away from that particular um, uh, module and have commented on is the fact that the, um, the opportunity to learn from the experience of, of, of others and other leaders um, and to deeply reflect on specific areas of practice and re through the research and resources that apply to their own, you know, their own leadership or their own practice or their own coaching practice or, in fact, the culture in their school or workplace. Um, also to sharpen, really sharpen their thinking around coaching and, and their own practice. So we've had some very, some people who have been new to coaching, but we've also had some people who actually um, very experienced coaches do the do the program and um, and have really reflected on how much that uh, the course, but then the exploration of the re of those um, the research has really helped them to sharpen their their practice and really consider the specifics around you know where they can um, I guess improve and develop others. So that that's that's fantastic. Um, and also uh, they've kind of cited you know talked about citing that evidence as um, uh, to sustain, so to sustain coaching, the value of coaching and education, so in promoting and, I guess, um, advocating for and influencing up, you know, um, that there's real value in having that research resource and all of that research available to do that in whatever context people need to do that's relevant, you know, to their, to their situation. Um, identifying things that are important, so what's important when you're undertaking you know, to build a coaching culture or to build coaching capability. So, um, you know, things like to have a clear a vision, to have um, a coalition, you know, um, work with the willing, so to speak. So have a group of people who are really believe in it and king and push it and champion it forward. So lots of things like that. Um, and as you mentioned, so um, highlighting topics to add to the, to the research base. So it's kind of, I guess, raised more questions for some people. Um, you know, through through doing that extra that the research, um, and one that I yeah, this really kind of I, this really spoke to me in terms of um, uh, exploring ideas more deeply, but also reading around or redoing read around on topics that uh, relate to PD. So when you're you know undertaking PD in your school or, or educational context. Um, you know, looking for the specific research around that particular area of practice or PD so that people are extending their learning and their understanding and their awareness through, you know, not just the actual activity. I suppose that speaks a little bit to, um, you know, applying learning and then then actually, you know, moving it beyond the event of PD, I guess. So, yeah, so some really great um, insights there and, and really, really reinforcing, I think, that um, element of research in, in, the, in the course. Yeah, yeah, and and Christian makes the point about 
um, research theory and practice and that the, the research sh should inform what we, what we our, our practice and the, the things that we're going to research next should come out of the previous findings and so on. So there, there's a, a kind of circle there of all of it feeding on, um, you know, everything feeding on everything else. The, these are um, these are really powerful statements. That, that's super. Hmm. A couple so have, of, have we got any questions? Yeah, there's a couple of questions. Um, and I see Christian has joined us and has added a couple of comments in there. So there's a couple of questions uh linda thank you linda she says she's interested to know how we might ensure quality in coaching provision any thoughts on that yes i, I would love to have that conversation with yes. with linda directly because i would i would say what are your thoughts at the moment what what do you think at the moment my my response to that immediately is is have really good high quality coaching training um so that so that people understand um, what coaching is and how to apply a coaching approach to other things, um, so that the quality of the training and the ongoing reflection and the ongoing reflective practice about coaching is really vital. And I mean, I know that's kind of in a nutshell. That's that's what I'm thinking. What what are your own thoughts, Sharon? Mm. No, I, that was actually yes yeah, one of the things that came to mind to mind for me. But I suppose, um, yeah, I, I, yeah. So that good training, and then I guess the maybe the reflective practice. You know, being able to being able to do, um, you know, ensure that coaches and the coaching team, so to speak, are, are doing that reflective practice and maybe even engaging in some formalised um, reflective practice to continue to build and develop and, yeah. 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 Um, thank you. And then uh, Leslie, oh, Leslie, so thank you, has just asked about research which um, around coaching as a means to support first-generation students in higher education. Thank you. Christian's actually given a... <laughs> um, made mention there of a doctoral study. So thank you for that. And Christian has asked the question, thank you. What, what are coaching, so if the coaching and education research is focusing on right now, so at the moment, Margaret? Oh, is that, is that him asking asking me? It looks as if he's asking other people as well. Yes, really, I say. We've got some, some replies here. So, um, and Leslie, Oh no, two years ago there's been a doctoral study um, and Dion, so sorry, I'm, I'm getting a bit confused here, but um, replies, uh -huh, yeah. Yeah, Dion Spencer, PhD, Coaching Aspects of Self, a phenomenological study of students from underrepresented groups studying within higher education. So yeah, that, yeah highlighted that, um, that there, so thank you. So any comment there around the the what researchers are focusing on at the moment in terms of coaching and education? Um, okay. Well, the 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 informal things that that I know of, and I only you know because things haven't been published yet, I don't necessarily know about them. I'm a I'm a curator and a collector. Really. Yes. <laughs> um, I think there's increasing interest in. In instructional coaching, um, in areas that haven't um, traditionally had instructional coaching, and you know, I my concern there is that people do use that. Um, they use the partnership approach, for example, of, of Jim Knight's partnership approach for instructional coaching, and if they're researching that, that they're they're doing it with integrity, and um, in a in a partnership way and not being um, pushed by other people to say, just get that instructional coaching thing done and then we'll all be sorted. That I'm, I'm just a wee bit concerned about that. Um, well-being certainly increasing. More and more people are, are trying coaching for well-being and um, studies and that. Looking forward to seeing a lot more of them. Peer coaching, um, because of budget um, constraints and so on, there's peer coaching, and it is important that the peer coaches are are trained well, you know, for that to work well. And and there is 
there is evidence that it that it works better. Mm. What you. else have we got here? Uh, so John, and similarly, similarly to, and in fact, I think you've just spoken to that a little. Um, but John has asked, from your perspective, um, what would be the most interesting area of coaching and education where you, you would like to see further research? Personally, I would I would love to see more research about coaching engagements with parents because parents are a key you know you hear people talking about the triangle of this you know the parent and this the student and the school and so on and for parents for, for a real partnership a coaching approach with parents and teaching parents how to use a coaching approach with their own children I would I would love to see personally I would love to see more research about that because I think there's just so much potential for that. And then I'd, I'd love to say, oh, well, John, what, what would you think? What would you like to see? And mm -hmm. I see Lynn says, actually, she's in Scotland, so we might actually have that conversation. Yeah. That would be yeah. lovely. That's excellent. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> um, and interestingly, just on that, um, yeah, so Owen Fraser, he, thank you, Owen, just said, thanks so much. He's currently involved in some work on effective transitions. And um, is going to look into the research on community and parental coaching. So that just, yeah, that's that's that. Thank and you. actually, Margaret, that was one of the um, one of the reflections I was having. As you know, you were talking through the global framework, and that particularly the community portal. Um, one of my many moons ago experiences in a school leading a, a whole school improvement process, um, where where parents were part of part of the leadership team. Um, leading that process and part of that work was at the time we didn't call it coaching but all of the development work that we did as a leadership team to build our capacity to lead and improve and to engage community uh, you know to read redefine or redevelop pedagogical approaches and so on there are a whole whole range of kind of elements of that work but was was very much focused on listening on um, paraphrasing and summarising, on notes, like I'm using our, you know, our skills, our key, key skills, language. But at the time, those were the things that we were really focused on building, building that capacity. And the four parents that we had in that group, um, it was just phenomenal the impact that that had to have them involved in that work as kind of leaders of educators and but leaders of the community. Um, and then in terms of the impact that that then had on the way, you know, they, the way they communicated, the way they advocated, the way, the way the community engaged with the school around, you know, the improvements, um, those whole school improvement strategies and so on. So it really reinforced the potential of that, that particular yeah. portal. And um, <laughs> it did cross my mind. I thought, oh, that would have been, you know, that would be an amazing research study, but it was way too long ago now. But um, oh, I was going to say, I hope somebody wrote that up, but no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's too long ago now. But, um, but yeah, uh, I think that um, lots of potential in that space, isn't there? Yeah, and Alwyn, um, Alwyn's a, a good friend of GCI and, and oh. gets us, which is, which is really oh, good. So, um, the the work on effective transitions that that will be that will be really interesting to see and all and maybe we can have a conversation about how mm -hmm. if I can help and you know for you to share that with with people that would be that would be wonderful yeah yeah what yes and about? John's not that's that's it for questions thus far John's just made a lovely yeah. comment about coaching and coaching approach, approaches that can be at the heart of any school improvement initiative and I, I certainly yeah. think yeah absolutely yeah, yeah thank you the the and the and and the conversations it's, it's all about the the conversations that we have but mm. yes it's it's hard to imagine um a school improvement initiative that you know is 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 really good that doesn't have whether you call it coaching but that those those mm. principles behind it yeah yeah excellent thank you gail's just added a comment in there she loves the idea of using coaching, coaching approach with parents and children. So, yeah, so perhaps it's an area that will um, build and grow and we can... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And Christian and uh, Mary Briggs at the University of Warwick did a study some years ago with primary children and taught them uh, coaching type skills and, and they were giving feedback to one another, quite young children. Uh, so, you know the the potential for even quite young children to to coach one another and whether you're it's a formal thing and it, and it could be I still think it could be 
pretty young. Um, so that that's great that you you, you like that that mm. idea. Yeah. And Chris, thanks, Chris. Welcome. He's um he's just added a comment in here about says sharing that uh, our GCI friend and colleague Alex. Oh, Alex. Good sorry. Day. You yeah yeah yeah. yeah. Did you say Goodis at Thomas Cup College? Yeah, in Western and in Melbourne's Western suburbs, completed his doctorate looking at the impact. Oh. Of, yeah, of our coaching model on teacher capacity, and the link is in there, folks. Oh, so, wow. um, oh right, right. Well, that's going in the resource if if if, he's, if it's open <laughs> and it's happy, I'll contact him. Lovely. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. really good. So that that link there, we we can see that Sharon, but anyone listening, they wouldn't they wouldn't see that link. But um, I'll I'll. We'll find a way to get that to. We'll find a way to get that to people, will we? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we can include that with the um, uh -huh. with the email when it yes. Yeah. 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 After Absolutely. after the after the after the webinar email. All right. Well, we're getting close to to time there, Margaret. Is there anything? We, if we don't have, oh wait a minute. Sorry, I missed a couple of questions right, yeah. here. They've ducked down on the page. Lucy's question is: Is there any research on coaching and education in other cultures and countries? Thank you for that. Non-English speaking, essentially. Thanks, Lucy. There, there must be. There, there must be. I, I don't know. And Christian may correct me. But I don't know of any English language studies of coaching and education in other um, cultures and countries. I, I just think there must be, and it's a, it's a gap that it, this is this is just English language. So wouldn't that be fascinating to read? Um, and John's asking, can we consolidate the chat in the Q&A text? Don't know, John. I'll leave that to Sharon. <laughs> That's a technological challenge. <laughs> Let me just, so the only thing I've popped in the chat, because the chat's not it's disabled for everybody else, I believe, but um, the only thing I've put in there is the two links, so the link to the resource and the link to Margaret's oh, blog, right. which explains oh, the resource. So I just I'll pop that in there. So, but everybody has that on your. Um, you all got an email today with the links to those two documents, and we'll also put that on the email that you get following with the. So there'll be a recording of the webinar that you'll get via email in a couple of days or a week or so after the um, after today, and it'll also the recording. Uh, Yes, we'll be up on and it'll be up on our website. So we'll make sure that we include that link and the links, obviously, to the you've got them. But we'll just re, you know resend those again to the to the resource and the blog if that's okay, John. Yep. Um, all right. Well, um, anything more there, Margaret? From you, any kind of final oh, um, comments? I'm happy to be contacted by anyone. In fact, as an invitation for anyone to contact me, but things that could enhance that resource, you know, within the limits of the time I have available. But I, ideas to, to do that, just to, um, it, it's just wonderful to have so many people on here engaging with us. And, it, and it's, a, it's a real privilege to, to, to curate that um, resource. And I'm sure it will evolve a lot um, over the years, but it's great to have been able to, to start it. And I'm very grateful to Christian for, for saying, yeah, that could work. Uh -huh. Let's just <laughs> let's just do that. Fantastic, and I'm sure um, many, many, many of us. I know I've. Um, that's an amazing. It's an amazing resource, and I really, um, I've really enjoyed kind of, yes, exploring that thus far. Um, um, but yes, yeah, so thank you for for creating it, and thank you for keeping it live and updated. It's fantastic, and I'm only going to get better. I'm sure over time. So. Thank you. And I just want to say, you know, thank you so much, Margaret, for um, for today. And um, thank you to everybody for your participation and your questions and comments. Um, greatly appreciated. Um, and just to encourage you, as Margaret said, to subscribe so that if you're not already receiving our um, our latest insights and information and events and news, et cetera. If you, if you um, please, we'd ask you to do that and also visit our website to have a look at um, our offerings and, and definitely our free resources and so on. And that's where this, the recording will be.